to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. Jesus said, For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Matthew chapter 26, verse number 28. We welcome you today to our study of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ as found in Matthew chapter 26 through 28. We're so glad that you joined us for our study today. We want to encourage you, if you don't have your Bible with you, to pause for just a moment, locate your Bible, get it out to Matthew's 20, Matthew 26 through 28, as we're going to look to the Word of God in our study today. And friend, we just want you to know that today's lesson is being brought to you by individual Christians and congregations of the Lord's Church. The Lord's Church in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. Whether that be on Sunday morning for worship, Sunday night or Wednesday night for Bible study, you would be an honored guest at any of their assemblies. You'll find people there who love God, who love others, and who'd be happy to sit down and discuss the scriptures with you. If you'd like to know more about the church or salvation, about Jesus and how to worship Him, please visit the Church of the Lord in your area and they'd be glad to talk to you about that. Friend, we also want to help you here at The Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From there, you can locate all our material online. We have video lessons, audio lessons, transcripts, study questions, written material, all available to you free of charge 24-7. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson, we can make that available to you as well. Just go to our website, fill out a free media request form. If you'd like to have a digital download, we can make that available instantly. Or if you'd like to have a DVD or CD, we can put that in the mail to you as well. And friend, we just want you to know, we're so happy that you joined us today as we're going to study about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. No more moving and important topic could we find than this. It's the heart and core of the gospel message. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 3. And it's what motivates men to want to serve God and give their life to Him. And so let's begin in Matthew chapter 26, where we see the seed starting of the Lord being sold out by Judas. Look at Matthew 26, beginning in verse number 1. Now it came to pass, when Jesus had finished all these sayings, that He said to His disciples, You know that after two days is the Passover, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Then the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders of the people assembled at the palace of the high priest, who was called Caiaphas, and plotted to take Jesus by trickery and kill Him. But they said, Not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. And when Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him, having an alabaster flask of very costly fragrant oil. She poured it on his head as he sat at the table. But when his disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? For this fragrant oil might have been sold for much and given to the poor. But when Jesus was aware of it, he said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? She has done a good work. You have the poor with you always, but me you do not always have. For in pouring this fragrant oil on my body, listen to this, she did it for my burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. Friend, we begin to see Jesus is, is, is getting so close and the hour is drawing near that His life is going to be over. And so they're plotting to kill Him already, but they're waiting for the right time to do that. And then, as He gathered in this house, 
This woman comes and, and breaks this bottle of perfume. Can you imagine the smell that would have flooded that house? Very costly, fragrant uh, oil. Jesus, it runs down Jesus' head, covers his body, and, and the disciples, they're thinking to themselves, this is so expensive. Why did she just waste that? Jesus said, no, she did this for my burial. And whenever the gospel is preached, it'll be told what she did. And so today we think about that great act of this woman, how she prepared Jesus for his burial. But then as the moment is growing so close and so intense, Jesus needs help from on high, no doubt. He goes into the garden. In Matthew chapter 26, you remember, he takes Peter, James, and John with him there. He's in great anguish of spirit, the Bible tells us. He tells those disciples, you watch and pray with me. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And so every time he comes back, and they fall asleep. But listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 6, 39. Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, but not, not my will, but thine be done. Listen to that attitude. Can you imagine being in that situation, about to die, knowing that's coming, knowing the suffering, knowing the pain, knowing the agony that's about to take place, and still having that submissive of an attitude? Truly, Jesus is the perfect example. But then as that garden scene closes, the torch lights begin to approach. Judas with that group of men from the Pharisees and the, 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 the scribes, they come to Jesus, they, they take him and they take him into that inner area and, and Jesus is there being put on trial. They bound the hands of Jesus. Peter denies our Lord. Remember that, before the rooster crows, you'll deny me. And it did that and Peter wept bitterly because he had denied the Lord. They took Jesus, according to Matthew 27 verse two, they bound his hands and they led him away to be put on trial, to be crucified. And friend, it's these events in Matthew 27 that I want us to mainly think about today with this purpose in mind. Listen to these words. God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Paul will say, for scarcely for a righteous man would one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone might dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I want you to pause and think about with me today that while I was still a sinner, while man was still steeped in sin, while we were separated from God without hope, Jesus died so that I don't have to spend eternity separated from God. Let's read some of these verses together. Take your Bible and, and, and look how Jesus, the perfect Son of God, takes the place of a common criminal for me and you. Look at Matthew 27, verse 15 through 21. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to releasing to the multitude one prisoner whom they wished. And at that time they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, Who do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Christ? For he knew they had handed him over because of envy. While he was sitting on his judgment seat, his wife sent him, saying, Have nothing to do with that just man, for I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the multitudes that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. Which, the governor answered and said to them, Which of these two do you want me to release to you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate said, What shall I do with Jesus who is called the Christ? They all said, Let him be crucified. Then the governor said, Why? What evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, saying, Let him be crucified. Here's a man, Barabbas, who had committed crimes, treason and, and, and things like that. He deserved to die for those crimes. And when they cry out, 
I'm going to release somebody. Who do you want? Me? Jesus, crucify him. Give us Barabbas. Think about that for a moment. Common criminal, a notorious criminal. Jesus took his place. Didn't Jesus do the same thing for me and you? I had sinned. I'd broken the law of God. Like all of us, we've, we've done things, many things probably, that are not right and good. Just like Jesus took Barabbas' place, Jesus took my place as well. The Bible says He Himself bore our sins in His own body upon the tree, that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. I'm not that different than Barabbas, nor are you, in the sense that we have violated the law of God. We are criminals in the sense that we have sinned against God and broken His law. And somebody took our place. And I didn't have to suffer at that moment for my crimes. Look at what Jesus did suffer. Jesus, our Lord and Savior, was scourged for me and for you. Listen to Matthew 27, verse number 26. Then Pilate released Barabbas to them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. You know what? One of the things about the Bible that's so unique is it just says this almost, he scourged Jesus. Men would write volumes on what that means and the intensity of it. And do we really understand how intense that was? Something like a, with a wooden handle, leather straps coming off the end likely, like a cat of nine tails with metal or glass or rock or bone embedded the end of it. Jesus' back would be stretched tightly, likely around some pole, some Roman soldier would take the wooden handle of that whip and over and over again on the back of Jesus. And the Bible just mentions that in passing. Listen to it again. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him by his stripes. What stripes? The stripes during the scourging. By his stripes, we were healed. Look at Matthew 27, 29. Not only is Jesus scourged, Jesus has a crown of thorns placed on His head. Matthew 27, 29. When they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on His head and a reed in His right hand. They bowed the knee before Him and mocked Him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. When we think about that crown of thorns, maybe you've been out in the woods and you've seen these trees that have the real long thorns on them. Some of those branches are real twisty. I saw one a while back and man, it had long thorns on it. I think about wrapping that around and making a crown and placing that on the head of Jesus, taking that reed and beating him on the head. They're mocking the Lord. You say you're a king, let us make you a crown. You say you're a king, let us give you a reed. And they, they began to mock Jesus. Can you imagine? These people's creator, these people's God, the one who is about to make the ultimate sacrifice so some of them as well could have the hope of eternal life. They're mocking. They're making fun of Jesus. Watch what happens next. Matthew 27, verse 30. Then they spat on him, took the reed, and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they took the robe off him, put his own clothes on him, and led him away to be crucified. You ever been spit at? You ever had anybody spit on you? Nothing could be probably more degrading or gross than to have somebody spit on you. Here they see Jesus in this fake crown with this fake reed and claiming to be a king and spit right on him. Take that reed and hit him on the head where those crown of thorns are. Jesus didn't have to take that. You know, when I think of Jesus said, Do you not know that I can call down legions of angels at this time? I think, now would be a good moment, Lord. Right when they spit on me, that would be calling them down, right? Jesus didn't do that. What else happened? They took that robe. Now think about this. Jesus was scourged, beaten over and over again on his back. Bloody, mutilated back. Purple robe is put on. That robe adheres to his back. The blood dries and it sticks there. Then they take that robe and rip it off, just like ripping a Band-Aid off. They rip that robe off and the pain and the intensity of it comes all over again. Then notice Matthew 27, 
verse 35. Then they crucified him and divided his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they casted lots. Again, this, the Bible doesn't elaborate very much on this. It just simply says they crucified him. What was a crucifixion? They took Jesus' hands and feet and they nailed that to a wooden cross. Imagine, you take his hands, you stretch them out, nails in each of his wrists, his feet place a nail in that, and think about what that would require. For every breath you took in, pressure had to be put on the nail in your ankles. For every breath that you let out, pressure had to be put on the hands. And so to, for every breath in or out, the pain was excruciating. The blood loss, the agony, the pain, it hurt with every breath Jesus took. And He hung there in agony for me and you. And on top of the pain, people come by and they mock Jesus on the cross. Look at verse 41. Likewise, the chief priest also mocking Him with the scribes and elders said, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he's the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we'll believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will. For he said, I am the Son of God. Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. If the pain and the agony wasn't enough, the very people he was dying for, some of them, are actually making fun of him in that process. You ever seen people make fun of somebody who's down or hurt? Or maybe it's not like everybody else. Pick, pick, pick on people, make fun of people. Can you imagine Jesus on the cross having to endure that? If He's the Son of God, let Him come down now from the cross. Boy, we'd come down in a minute. Jesus could have come down in a moment, but He didn't do that. He stayed on that cross in spite of the fact that He had the power to do just what He wanted to. Then look what happens next. Verse number 50. Jesus dies on that cross. The Bible says in Luke, in Matthew 27, verse 50, And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up His spirit. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two, from top to bottom, the earthquake, the rocks were split, graves were opened, many of the bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. Coming out of the graves after His resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So when the centurion and those who were with him were guarding Jesus, saw the earthquake, the things that had happened, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this is the Son of God. Many women who followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to Him, were looking on from afar. He goes on to list who those were. Friend, again, just with a brief statement. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice, yielded up His Spirit, and He died. Again, men would write volumes about this. He was, listen to these words again, He was bruised for our iniquities, chastisement of our peace was upon Him, by His stripes we are healed. He, he tasted death for every man. 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. He died so that I don't have to die spiritually. Here's this, this perfect man. Lived a good life. Went about doing good. Helped the sick. Healed those who were in, in, in pain and agony. Fed the poor. Did good unto all men. Taught people how to love God and, and serve Him. And what thanks did He get? They put Him on a cross, hung Him there till He died. Why did Jesus do that? He did that for me, and He did that for you. You see, my friend, I want you to make this personal. I deserved, because of my sin, to die. The soul who sins shall surely die, Ezekiel 18, 4. The wages of sin is death. Romans 6, 23. And there's not a righteous man on the face of the earth who does good and does not sin. Ecclesiastes 7, verse 26 through 29. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Sin separates me from God. I've sinned and you've sinned if you're of an accountable age and I deserve to die 
and be lost because of that sin. But Jesus died in my place. He died so that I don't have to die forever. He gave His life as a sacrifice so that I don't have to spend eternity separated from God. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though He was rich, yet He became poor that we through His poverty might be made rich. God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. He Himself is the propitiation for our sins, but not for ours alone, for the sins of the whole world. He tasted death for every man. Thank God that Jesus loved me and He loved you enough that He stood in my place and died for me so that I don't have to. But here's the good news. You know, the gospel is good news, right? And if the story ends there, it's not completely good news. The good news is the grave could not contain our Lord. I want you to look in your Bible at the rest of the story, beginning in Matthew chapter 28. Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb, and behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning, his clothing as white as snow. The guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid. I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. Listen to this. He is not here. He is risen. And he said, Come and see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he's risen from the dead. Indeed, he's going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. Isn't that the follow-up, the rest of the story? You've got his, his death, his burial in that new tomb. And at this point, even the, some of the disciples kind of go back to their life and they, they, they don't know what's going to happen next. And then they hear the words, He is not here. He is risen. My friends, the resurrection of Jesus is the victory that we have. Let's say a man died for me and he was buried in the tomb for me and made a great sacrifice for me. That's all good and well, but we've still got the problem of death. The Bible says this, He Himself, He through death, overcame Him who had the power of death and released those who all their lifetime were subject to bondage. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory. Victory over what? Victory over death through our Lord Jesus Christ. The resurrection and the power of it is what makes Christianity so amazing. I, I, there's no doubt. It's appointed a man once to die and then the judgment. But friend, what's so good about being a Christian is death is not the end. Death is the beginning of something so much greater for the child of God. Listen to these words. At the death of Lazarus, Jesus said in John 11, 25 and 26, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he'll never really die. And Jesus said, you'll live again. All who are in the graves will one day come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life. John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29. We have a hope of the resurrection. One day, when my spirit leaves this body, and the body returns to the dust of the earth, I know one day I'll hear that trumpet. I'll hear that voice of the archangel. And I know one day I can meet the Lord in the air. 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 13 through 18, all in the grave will come forth. The Bible tells us that we will meet Jesus in the air and thus we shall always be with the Lord. And so my friend, here's our plea to you today. Think about what Jesus did for me and for you. Think about allowing Himself to be handed over to evil men. Think about what He suffered in the garden preparing for this. Hearing Peter deny Him. Ha having one of His own, Judas, sell Him out for 30 pieces of silver. Think about how it must have felt. 
to hear the people cry out, Give us Barabbas! Crucify Jesus. Think about the scourging. They slapped Jesus on the face, placed that crown of thorns on His head. When they nailed His hands and His feet to a cross, and in pain, He took every breath on that cross. Think about Him dying there. Died for me, and He died for you. But that's not the end of the story. Death and the grave could not contain the power of our Lord. He defeated Satan and He defeated death by rising from the grave. On the cross and by rising from the grave, He defeated all of that. And because of that, I don't live any longer and you shouldn't live any longer in fear of death. And so I ask you today, does that mean anything to you? Does what Jesus did mean anything to you? Friend, if it does, then won't you do something with it? We encourage you today, if you're not a child of God, to obey the gospel. Do you believe Jesus is God's Son? Would you be willing to turn from a life of sin and give your life to God in repentance? John 8, 24, Luke 13, verse 3. Would you acknowledge verbally, I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God? Romans 10, uh, verses 9 and 10. Would you be immersed in water to contact His death, burial, and resurrection and rise out of that watery grave to walk in newness of life? Romans 6, verses 1 through 4. Friend, if you're not a Christian, we encourage you to do that today. And if you are a Christian, and maybe you're not where you need to be, think about the cross. Get your life right. And for those of us who are trying to walk in the light, may it motivate us every day to do just that. We're glad you joined us for our study of the Gospel of Matthew. Join us next time as we study more from the Word of God. Today's closed captions are brought to you by Christian Family Bookstore in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We encourage you to visit thechristianfamilybookstore.com for all your Christian book needs. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the Gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, Internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844 844- Six Gospel. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the gospel of Christ.